Well, hello again, everyone, and welcome to uh, the next in our series of webcasts that we're bringing you from Travel Weekly as part of our Roadmap to Recovery. And this one is a very special webcast because we're doing it in association with ATAS, which is, of course, the Association of Touring and Adventure Suppliers. And so I'm delighted to be joined today by three of the members of ATAS. So we've got Zena Benchek, who's from Intrepid. So hi, Zena. Hi, we've everyone. Got Phil Hula, who's the CEO of Riviera, and Neil Alabaidi, who's the CEO of New Market. So welcome, all of you. Thank you for joining us. And we picked you particularly uh, because obviously you've all started, you've resumed uh, operations. Not the whole lot, uh, small scale, I think. But um, perhaps we'll start uh, with you, Neil, if we may. Um, I think your first tour back was August the 21st, am I right? That was a Scottish Highlands Railway tour. Um, yeah, that's I wrote right. a story yesterday about you announcing another 100 departures this month and next month. So tell us how that, uh, you know, what decisions you came to and how it's going. So uh, unsurprisingly, it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride. Um, we got, as you say, our first tour away 21st of August. That was Scottish Highland Railways. Um, since then, we've had a trip go to Belfast, uh, a trip go to Krakow. And then today, one go to Jersey. And then, as you say, again, we're aiming to get about 100 more tours away over the next four to six weeks. Um, how have we, <laughs> what's the process been like uh, getting there? So uh, I guess the first thing is to make sure it's commercially viable. Uh, obviously, safety is really key, but unless you're going to make any money out of it or there's, there's a return for the business, there's no point in selling the tours. So it, it's all started with um, viewing what the, the, local FCO advice, when could we start uh, sending tours away. Next steps, obviously, making sure you, could, you can make some money out of it. Um, with escorted touring, as I'm sure most people are aware, there's a load factor you have to hit to make money, um, but you can renegotiate with your suppliers. But then you've all also got the, the constantly changing situation with air. You've, you've got funds that you've already given to airlines, you've also got them changing their schedule. So regional departures dropping out randomly, date changes. So that's the first process. Then obviously very, very quickly after that is customer safety. Um, and a huge amount of work was done on that. Looking at ABTA advice, look at WTTC advice. We've got our own uh, health and safety uh, manager talking to the local um, destinations good example being Jersey where our customers arrived today first trip there you all have to be tested on arrival so general feedback we've had is that all went really well was fairly pain-free um, and we've, we've tried to have someone from head office on all these initial tours as well to join the tour manager lots of training for the tour manager lots of tweaks to the processes around social distancing where masks are required um, talking to the hotels to ensure that they are following new guidelines. Um, and it's, I think, the most critical piece is you've got to be really, really flexible because the picture is changing all the time. Uh, you're constantly evaluating new changes to guidelines, both here and abroad. Uh, so it's two looking both ways. Um, and you are constantly trying to learn but, but we're very, very early into it. So we're only, our, our third trip only yeah. brings back today. Um, so we'll learn from there. Okay, all right. Well, we'll come back. To, I want to pick up on lots of things you said, but let's bring the others in. And uh, Phil, Neil mentioned there that he'd sent uh, someone from head office on every tour. And I know you um, sent your agency, sales, your, your team went out uh, to Italy before you put yeah. Italy back uh, on. So tell us about that. Why was that so important that you went out yourselves to see what, what it was going to be like? Yeah, we ran um, around two or three you know, short sort of recce tours almost with a range of staff from head office before we uh, kicked back off with, with customers. I think there were two reasons. I mean, first and foremost, to check that you know, the safety and the experience was kind of where we wanted it because it's, you, know, you can only tell so much from the phone calls and so forth you do back at base. Secondly, actually, to give the staff you know, some insight and some confidence. So in the conversations they're having, you know, time and again, over uh, the recent weeks with customers about traveling, it makes such a massive difference if they or one of their colleagues you know, down the corridor has been on one of these trips and actually knows what it's like at the airport or how great it is at Lake Garda when there's nobody there and 
So building that confidence was a really key thing. And actually that proved to be a real positive, much more so than I, I kind of hoped. So we ran those two or three um, test tours, if you want to call it that. And then I think a bit like Neil, I mean, it's, uh, it's been a complicated and ever-changing picture. And we must have had about two or three sort of restart plans that you know, went by the wayside. Or, uh, and we have begun again, but I will say it's at a relatively small scale. At one point, I think we were due to send probably something like 30,000 passengers away on tours in, in the autumn. Um, we've run, we've actually got two in process at the moment, both in Italy at the lakes. And we've got uh, a dozen or so more planned during September, um, mostly again to Italy, um, because that's a very popular destination. And we think we've got a good setup and yeah, the, the safety levels are very high and so forth. And we hope to run also some river cruises. Um, in, we plan to run some river cruises in September, uh, primarily in Portugal on Douro. So there will be a programme, but it's not going to be huge scale. And again, as Neil mentioned, it's a question of just keeping really close to developments, be that flights or quarantine or restrictions or attractions and so forth. I think the only other thing that, that, I'll add that we have done a lot of, um, and I think it's really helped, is talking to the customers themselves. You know, we, we, we actually sent a survey to almost all the people due to travel in the sort of September, October period and sort of said to them, you're very straightforward way, are you up for this? Do you, do you want to go away? How do you feel about it? Do you not? And it, 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 was, it, was, it was very encouraging and it was quite insightful. I mean, that I think something like 40% came back and said, look, we, we want to travel this year. Yeah, half of those were dead keen and would go yeah, any way you gave them the chance and half were okay, maybe, but the rest would say, okay, perhaps I'll move to last next year. But that, that allowed us then to kind of work with those customers who were keen and move people around and, uh, I mean, the whole thing's been pretty labour intensive, but we were very, very keen to sort of try and find a way to get back out there, both for our own perspective to get some confidence and yeah. get back into it, and also for customers. Okay, great. Well, it, I mean, it is wonderful to see things happening, and I, and actually, one of my own team joined an intrepid trip. So, Katie, our feature editor, joined your trip, um, Zena. Perhaps you can tell us what you've um, restarted, because I think it's so far just your retreats, your your sort of. Well, you explained, but yeah. Katie went to Athens with you. But what, what have you opened up? Yeah, we've um, um, we've actually stopped our operations until the end of September, our global operations, because we sell from different markets. And it was too complicated for us to think, you know, every month, uh, only a month ahead of, you know, are we going to, you know, operate trip next month or not? Because there was too much complication. We decided to do it for a very long period of time. But then during that period, we thought of, you know, with the opportunity that FCU advisors would change in some countries in Europe, uh, with the possibility for us to launch a domestic range that we've always wanted to do, that we never really had time to do before, uh, that we could come with a maybe staged approach. Um, and um, if you remember, we've discussed that the other day, uh, Lucy, is we, we've launched a range of retreats, we call them intrepid retreats, that, was also, that were also built in a way that will bring um, a bit more customer confidence that maybe this trip will look a bit more safer in a way because they're center-based, they are shorter, they don't go to more than one accommodation, um, and um, they are all in uh, places where, you know, FCU advice, pending changes that uh, can happen and quarantine requirement changes uh, will allow uh, our customers to go to these places. So basically until the end of uh, September, all our global operations were stopped, but then we reopened some small group adventure that we created for that period of time. So the first one was in Greece. Uh, Lucy, um, uh, sorry, Katie has joined it and it was a retreat in the island of Syros. So started in Athens, but you don't have to go uh, and spend a night in Athens before. You can actually fly in the morning if you want and, and join the tour straight after and then take the ferry. Um, it was a very um, good learning process for us because we've done a lot of work um, up front to prepare for the trip, risk assess, review every single element, train our tour leaders, train our suppliers. But there are also things that we did uh, learn as we were running the trip and one of the main main challenge um, which I think uh, is really relevant to what you mentioned before um, is this changes of regulation not just in the UK but in every single destination is an, an example um, a ferry from Athens to, to Syros would have a, a capacity of 50% and then the day after will 
it be extended to 80%. So we were already trying to split our group into two because, you know, didn't find enough tickets to be able to get them all in the ferry. But then the following day, we can actually get them all together. So it is a, it is a bumpy road. It is challenging, but it's very important that we do bring some hopes to our people, to our supply chain, to our tour guides, to, uh, and to our customers and agents that uh, travel is possible. It's just going to be a bit more work and a bit different. <laughs> Such a shame, all this. More work than ever, isn't it, uh, for all of us? Um, uh, what I'm really interested in is, that, I mean, you mentioned there, Zina, that you were not going to multiple accommodations. So you, you obviously feel that's perhaps a risk that you don't want to take. Um, others of you, I think, are. So, I mean, there's no sort of one rule, is there here? You, you know, how are you coming to your decisions about, and I know you, what you said there, Zina, it's, it sometimes depends on the destination that you're traveling to. But, you know, what kind of things have you, are you put in place? I know... For example, as well, I think, Zina, you're, only, you're, you're making sure any accommodation you use only allows, you know, or does allow single, sing, you know, single rooms in case people Enough. don't feel comfortable sharing. But what are these sort of, perhaps we can drill down into some of the specifics that you've, that you've sort of looked for for this restart of your programmes. Do you want to start us off, Neil? Uh, yeah, well, we've got a detailed health and safety audit that we do with each destination. And th there are certainly... Um, Simpl the simplicity associated with only going to one location but at the same time as long as you can maintain those standards in multiple locations it's fine so um, w we have worked with the local hoteliers to make sure that where they're staying multiple nights they, their rooms aren't cleaned the process of cleaning is is very very detailed if you look at Scotland they have a, a, a rules or last time I checked associated where nobody can stay in that room for a period after someone has been in that room. Okay. And so they, they, there's all different regulations and this ties back to, I think what we've all been saying, you, you have to work with the local standards, but then you have to have your minimum standards that you build on top of. Um, similarly with food, buffets um, are no longer something we do. But if you look at somewhere like Belfast, breakfast, the, the customers go and order it the night before there's a bacon butt in a bag waiting for them that they can take away so it, it, it's absolutely unique to every single product okay. every single destination the coaching element is probably something where we get more um of a, of a consistent approach so we are doing a maximum of 30 people on a 55 seat coach right so that allows them to sort of have a seat pretty much each or if they're I guess if they're a couple traveling then that's fine for them to be together they, they have they have an allocated seat and they sit right. in that same seat for the whole duration of the tour okay so they don't move around where possible we try and load the tour the coach in a certain order so there's less passing each other within narrow uh, within within the aisle front seats are left empty there's loads and loads and loads of detail uh, put into it and the thing that's been great, and it ties very much back to, to, to what's been said here, everyone wants this to work. The, the, yeah. the, the team here want it to work. The customers, the feedback, we've got one set that were on the, the Belfast tour this weekend. They booked two more tours over the next four, six weeks. So they're going on three trips with us over a very short period. People want this to work and the suppliers really want it to work. And the levels that they have gone to that we've seen on these first tours to ensure safety have been absolutely incredible. Now our job is to make sure that's maintained and that, that nobody takes the eye, their eye off the ball. We've got a responsibility to the customer, we've got a responsibility to our staff, we've got a responsibility to our brand, but we've also, we're very conscious we've got a responsibility to the industry because we've got to build confidence across the industry and, and anyone who makes mistakes damages it not just for themselves, but for the, for the whole industry as a, a, entirely. So there's pressure there and, and that, there's a lot we're doing to try and avoid being that person who, who makes that mistake. Yeah, absolutely. Gosh, that is quite a weight on your shoulders. I'll, I'll come back to that. But no, I just wanted to talk to you about, um, well, well, Neil mentioned, didn't he, that everybody wants this to work. People want to have a good time. And you were quoted in the story that we ran saying that actually people are having a richer and far more personal holiday experience. Yeah. Why, why do you say that? Because some might think, oh, actually, we're getting to go, but it's not going to be quite what we wanted. And we've got to wear a mask and we can't have a full buffet breakfast. Or, so 
what what makes you say actually that, that what you're able to offer at the moment is richer and uh, more personal? I think, I mean, if you do, I think if you do a lot of the preparation that sort of Neil talked about well, you choose the right destination, right country, location, and partners to work with. Actually, it's a slight cliche, but there's almost never been a better time to travel. Uh, and people, I, I definitely saw this from our own staff. You know, they're sitting, they've all been in lockdown and working from home and you're tiny a little bit nervous, but as soon as they kind of get out there and they're able to walk across Mark Square and take a photo with nobody in it or walk around the Lake Garden, there's literally the sun shining and it's full of a few Italians doing domestic tourism, but nothing else. Yeah, they, they love it and they've sort of been reawakened. So I genuinely think that, and we've had really good feedback from from the guests we've had on the two tours we've run so far. Uh, but yeah, if you do get that right, then it can be a sort of yeah, a chance to sneak out and have a really, really unique experience. Now that there are elements of it that are a little bit different. So yeah, people need to be aware of those in advance. And we've tried to be very clear and very honest with people about yeah, when you might need to wear face coverings and what is and isn't possible in terms of excursions and so forth. But in our experience so far, so long as people understand those, and again, we're careful about the tours that we've chosen and the way we support them. Yeah, I think it, uh, it in some ways, there's sort of almost a sense that the perception of it is way worse than the reality. And we've all got a job to do yeah, ourselves and you're working with our travel agent partners to, to, to rebuild that confidence. Yeah, we've all had our confidence knocked. Yeah. We've got to do it in the right way and not take any risks because yeah, that just sort of says all back. But but actually, I do really feel strongly that you know, when people get out there, as they're getting out there, they're remembering what they love about it. And actually, it's better. In some ways, it's better than ever. So Yeah, well, I guess fewer, fewer people on the tours than, as you say, you're going to, and fewer tourists in these places, you're going to... You're going to have a pretty amazing experience. I know. I know. Uh, Katie did on your trip, Zena, but she did mention that. You know, Phil just mentioned there that some of the excursions would have to change because I know you're not using public transport for your excursions. It's not a call. It's not a call for all our trips. Sometimes I found public transport more um, uh, actually squatted. Uh, you know, I've been in the metro the other day uh, in London, and it was at 8 a.m. at Westminster. It was empty. Yeah. I very safe. So the reality is not a call. In some tours, we decided uh, to, to change uh, in some routes the, the accommodation to private instead of public, but it's not a general call. We really do a, a risk assessment per product, per itinerary and per element of the itinerary and go into that level of details to decide if we think it's going to be risky. One of the good things about our, maybe our segment, all of us here, is that our tools are all uh, accompanied with, um, with the tool leader. And so we have the ability to change things on the ground. The leader can decide to change a restaurant because it's too crowded, because they're not respecting the sanitation, because there is no, I don't know, um, they're not following the local regulation and they can change. And I think this is what happened with transport as well. Even before COVID, when we used to take public transport in places like Italy, the tool leader will never book the one that is the most crowded because often customers have their back luggage and, and they don't want to end up uh, standing in a, in a, in a train. So um, it is a big chance that we have. And, and I feel, um, to your point, um, we really, we have customers who want to travel. They just want to know where. There is no zero risk in travel in, in any form. You know, We're here to mitigate the risk, to bring confidence, and having tour leaders, having operations, having policies in place, um, and having customers booking through the agent uh, um, is, is giving a lot of uh, structure and, and confidence that the travel experience would be a good one from the yeah. beginning the end um, and at the end of the day it is always a much better option uh, than trying to go by yourself uh, and if you find yourself in a situation how are you going to do to to you know um, how would you know where to go if this restaurant is, is packed or if, yeah. there, uh, if there is an issue uh, with the quarantine requirement that comes suddenly who's going to help you to book a new flight and all of these things so I think uh, um, we need to acknowledge that and there is no zero risk but we can mitigate and having a tour company a tour leader uh, with these processes and this protocol is really m limiting until um, the best way possible there is. Yeah, well, all of you have mentioned the role of the tour guide. Um, I think a couple of you said that you, they'd had gone through some retraining. So perhaps you can just talk about that because I know when people have been on tours, that's, the, the tour guide is often the, the person that really make, I know they see all these amazing places, but the tour guide is often the person that really makes 
the whole holiday for them because they're obviously really knowledgeable. They get them into places at different times. And obviously that's all part of a, of a really good tour. So what, what, what has the, the retraining entailed? I mean, you know, is it giving them more autonomy to make decisions like switching restaurants and things like that? What, what have you had to do? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah okay, well, you start. we'll go around again okay um so yeah you're, you're right it's about giving them more autonomy um it's about having some consistent standards that we approach and it's it's what to do if they have any concerns how they interact with us in the uk and how we respond to situations but but the the irony is we we put these packs together and we do the training but a lot of the time they're already more familiar with the local safety standards than we are. So, and these are people who've been in this industry a long, long time. They, they've been sat at home for six, seven months. Again, it goes back to the point earlier, they are desperate to showcase their destination, but they also know that if, if they're not up to standard, you, you can see what's happening in the UK with places being quarantined very quickly. So, so they, are, they, are, they have been probably more on it than we have they, they have added a lot of locality to that but it's, it's just that grounding it's it's that it's having a consistent set of processes to respond to scenarios and giving them the autonomy to to make the right decisions yeah, yeah. phil did you want to come in there yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with with a, with a lot of that i think um the role of the tour manager is always, always crucial but even more so yeah, one of the things we've done this year is we've restricted the group size on tours we're running to 20 as a maximum. And, and actually, on the ones we've run so far, in addition to the tour manager, we've, we've usually had one or two members of staff, partly, again, for the sort of familiarisation for them. So, uh, but a couple of, really a couple of key things. One is, during the course of the last couple of months, you know, we've got some real expertise from outside in terms of health and safety. To, and we've rewritten you know, those whole process and protocols as... as again, as Neil talked about. So there's been a period where we've had to make sure that our tour managers are fully trained on that and very familiar with it, of course. So that's part of it. I think beyond that, it's about just a lot of communication. And we've, we, the first couple of tours, we've had a quick daily update from the tour manager. This is what's going on, this is what's happening. Yeah, they are really good people. They're you know, keen as mustard to be out there and doing it and showing, what, showing us what they're made of. We had one example where actually the first tour we sent to the Italian lakes had a a couple of days it was actually in Switzerland the day after they arrived Switzerland went into quarantine and immediately had our tour manager reaching for the contingency plan and rerouting things and picking a couple of days and and did it brilliantly but but with that sort of group size and good communication and the right people on the tour actually it's able to be done in a very very positive way yeah. a lot of it is down to the you know, trusting the individuals having the right people partnering with you and that. and so do you see group sizes staying in this reduced numbers for some time then just in case you have to employ these contingency plans and be able to be quite fleet of foot about yeah, things I, I, I mean speaking for obviously for our business i think for 2020 we will obviously continue we will continue at that group sizing moving into 2021 we hope there's a move back towards some kind of normality we are actually going to offer uh, smaller group sizes for all of our most popular tours as part of our 2021 offer now as well so people will have the choice as to which way they want to tackle and, and is that something you've only decided to do because of covid and you think people might feel more comfortable to be with a smaller number of people yeah it's, it's something we've accelerated let's put it that right. way okay people, we, we find actually when we talk to our customers you get both opinions people really enjoy you know, the, the, the group the interaction the socializing meeting different people it's a really important part of you know, what your know, holiday with riviera travel is is about yeah there also are some people who'd say that, yeah, just like a little bit more space and autonomy, can I have a bit of the best of both? So actually what we've done is we've, 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 we're running a sort of dual offer with a, a significantly smaller group size, one slightly differently, and one with our sort of regular group size. Yeah, both are in, in, in really great experiences, just slightly different. Slightly yeah, different and presumably that, the price will reflect that if you want to go in a smaller group, that yeah. You'll, you'll, exactly. you'll pay a yeah. bit more. But, okay. but it can be done reasonably cost effectively, but there is a slight difference in price for the two. Exactly. Yeah. One of the things I just wanted to ask about, I mean, Zina, you talked about how there's, you know, no travel is without some degree of risk. And this is all about you guys mitigating it. And I, I absolutely agree with that. And I understand that. But, you know, we have obviously seen some people restart and then 
you know, whether it's in the cruise industry and then obviously was one line that had cases of COVID. We've now seen it on flights back from Greek islands. So, I mean, I think it's inevitable there is, there are going to be cases because COVID is with us, it's in the world. So what have you all put in place in the event that somebody on a tour was to come, you know, to, to, to test positive? What, what are your sort of plans for isolating them, the rest of the passengers, getting them home, et cetera? What, can, we, can we just talk through that so that agents understand what, you're, what you've got sort of planned for that eventuality? <laughs> We've got a pre-screening um, check that we get um, customers to, to fill, which is a form that they get to fill at the beginning of the, the trip and to, um, to, for the tour leader. To go back to the tour leader role, it's actually very relevant and what we do. So we, we do have 25 destination management companies around the world uh, that we that Intrepid own and it's a big plus for us in a way because this is through them that the tour leaders are trained, are employed, um, and get, receive this extra training where, that are relevant to the COVID, you know, uh, the, what is happening right now in this environment. So the tour leaders will actually receive uh, the list of uh, emergency contacts. They will know which are the hospitals that are the closest, um, where can we get testing uh, in each of the locations where the tours are, are happening, so they can act. So they have a first aid kit, uh, they will have extra masks, hand sanitizer with them, um, and then they will really follow the local regulation whenever uh, and if something would happen. I think that's the key here. As we do, we would do in, in our daily life, really, as you know, it could happen to us here in the UK. Uh, if it happens in holiday, it would be just the same thing. What we've done now um, that we've just implemented is um, uh, we've um, uh, contracted with um, uh, an insurance that has COVID um, uh, inclusion and coverage. So we can now offer COVID inclus um, inclusive insurance. And we know that there are a lot ha that have been doing it. The reality is that the UK is the first country uh, and I think uh, in Europe, Germany as well is doing it. Uh, there are lots of countries that are quite far behind, like Australia, they don't necessarily have COVID inclusive insurance, the borders are still closed, but we're quite advanced with that. And I think that's given a lot of assurance that if something would you're happen- You're recommending people take this policy. You've- Yes. You're sort of offering, you've teamed up with a broker that, that you're we, we, Exactly, product. and we're offering it, yeah. So, okay. and especially if customers ask, we offer one, but there are others. So, you know, we know APTA has created a, right. one so we do offer, we do explain that it exists because what people are concerned is what if I have to enter my flight and I have fever and I get screened and I have to go back home. Well, this insurance will cover you for that. Yeah. Okay. What if in the middle of the tour, I've got to, you know, I've got fever again, even COVID or no COVID, I have to stop the tour. Well, then, you know, your insurance will take care of hospitalization and some repatriation and, and all of this process. And again, the role of the tour leader to assist when a problem like this happened is critical because if you were by yourself and we've seen that when we were repatriating people I was uh, back then in Morocco in, in the month of March when we cancelled all our trips we were repatriating people and we had all our suppliers being very nice with us with our group taking care of them extending their stay so they can you know make sure that you know until they get the repatriation flights uh, organized and we had customers from you know other companies traveling by themselves asking us for help as well and this is how you see on the ground yeah. when things go wrong you know, what a tour company uh, is able to provide um, to, to customers versus, you know, independent traveler who've been just booking their stuff online. So um, to me, in this environment, it's actually critical. It's very important to, to talk about it. Okay. And, 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 sorry, sorry, just yeah, to add on to one of Zina's comments on the insurance. I certainly, I think there was an assumption that this, this insurance that covers COVID was going to be significantly more expensive. We have mm -hmm. now updated our policy and it's exactly the same price as the policy was pre these, these additional uh, COVID cover. So that's something we, we're trying to get out to people. It, it's, insurance is now catching up with, with the situation, yeah. certainly in the UK, and you're not having to pay a fortune. It's exactly the same insurance, it's the same price as our previous policy. Great, okay. And, and Phil, that obviously is great if you're the person that can't travel because you, you know, you're the one that gets the fever. What, what happens if someone is, you know, is ill or test possibly whatever while they're on the trip. And what happens to the other people on the yeah. trip then? Yeah, but I think it, it, it depends a little bit on the specifics. But again, yeah, it, people would be covered. One of the things, I mean, I totally agree with the sentiment. Travel insurance has been one of the really tricky things in conversations with customers. A real fear that they're not covered. And yeah, and some real work to do to reassure people that actually they almost certainly are. And then occasionally to fill a few gaps where you need to. And, and, and we've, we launched a policy a month or so ago. We just said, look, 
when it comes to cancellation or curtailment and having to come home, if you're not covered for any reason, then we'll cover you and you won't, we'll look after you. To just give that almost blanket reassurance because it is really something that's been uppermost in, in people's minds. Thankfully, I think the insurance side is catching up. When it comes to the specifics, it, it depends a bit on the situation. So if there's a single uh, couple or person um, shows symptoms and test, test positive and, and can be effectively isolated, then of course, you, you, and it's only needed to bring them home, you know, we would cover the cost of that. They would come back. If it was you know, two or more uh, couples or people, or even, heaven forbid, more widespread, we would curtail the holiday and, and, and bring everybody back at, at our oh. cost, and nobody would be worse, worse off for that. But oh. we would be, again, to Zena's point, it's very important when that's, any of those things start to happen, we work very closely with the local authorities because there are slightly different approaches and slightly different rules. If there's an opportunity to absolutely check it, it's just one individual, one couple, and you know, the talk can continue, we would do that, but we would test everybody. But if that's not the case and there's any risk, then we bring everybody back and, and we would cover the cost of that. Okay. I think that's really, really important for agents to understand how you're going to handle it because we can't be naive. It's, it's, it, I know what you were saying earlier, Neil, you don't want to be the one that gets it wrong, but that isn't getting it wrong. That's just the reality that, we're, that it's going to probably happen on somebody's tour. But it's as long as we then deal with these things properly and we show that you know, you're looking after your customers really well. I mean, I think that's that's what we want to get across so agents feel confident they can book their clients on, on holidays like yours. Um, I'm conscious of time. I just want to look ahead. Um, Phil, you mentioned 2021 and hoping to get back to, you know, a little bit more normality. What Can we just get a gauge of what bookings are like for, you know, 2021? Is, is, is it looking, I know you're getting a few people saying they're keen to travel still this year, but presumably a lot have moved into next year and what's the demand like where are they interested in going to should we start with you phil sure yeah of course it's um it's an interesting time right now i think as we enter into what would normally be a bit of a booking season and we'll see what level of demand there really is there you know, in the face of some fairly challenging sort of market news as well as um so first and foremost as you, I mean, as you rightly say there's what we have been doing all the way through 2020 is talking a lot to our customers and talking to our travel agent partners and for those customers who weren't able to or didn't want to travel, yet yeah, the majority actually, which is very encouraging, have moved into bookings for 2021. So there's a very strong foundation there of, of transferred passengers uh, throughout the whole of the 21 season. I think sort of new bookings, yeah, um, they, there's been a sort of steady trickle actually. We've done a little bit of marketing over recent months, but it's been very small scale. But it's been sort of working in that people have been prepared to book 2021, even some in 2020. We're slightly increasing the level of marketing going in September, October, but we're going to feel our way into that. Uh, but we are seeing some it, demand. It, people are keen to get out. That's not, of course, at the levels it would normally be at this time of year. Uh, people are just, I think, just waiting to sort of see. Yeah. The, the, the last few weeks has been tough. Yeah, the, the uncertainty of the sort of way the quarantine thing works is just giving people a bit more pause again. And I think if we can find a way to get past that, it would really help us. Yeah, okay, absolutely understand that. Zena, what about your um, sort of future business? Yeah, we also, um, we had bigger hopes for the rest of 2020. I think the flat, as everyone else, the bumpy uh, decision changing around um, quarantine has, um, has changed some of our plans because we had to take out uh, uh, some countries off the list and, um, and, you know, so still monitoring the situation. So I guess we have been quite successful in, in uh, moving um, uh, 2020 booking into 2021. We've only refunded around 10% so far. So the big goal is really to, to make sure we can operate uh, um, and you know, get those 90% on trips next year and not, get them, not have them to ask for refund later. Um, that's a big, big goal for us. What we're seeing is that people are, tend to um, book for the new bookings that come into uh, for maybe longer periods, um, what we call like a one-off type of trip, like Pola is quite successful, the Inca Trail is quite successful, um, like these experiences that you've always had in your bucket list and uh, you, you never, uh, you know, you've always thought you will do it one day, but maybe COVID has uh, made people realize that uh, you need to do it now when it's time. Uh, so, um, so this is what we're seeing really in terms of new booking. And again, you know, as I said, rebooking and credit, it's around 90% versus 10 refund. So uh, this market and specifically UK is trending much better than the others. So 
which is good. It shows that we've got some resilient British uh, people who are keen to, to, to explore the world. And we see this in our customer database when we survey them. Uh, people want to travel. They just don't know where and, and where and when. And it's all depending on, you know, getting more clarity and visibility around this quarantine and borders yeah. and all of this. So that's it. Yeah, as Phil said. Uh, and Neil, let's just ask you, what, what's, um, what's it looking like for you guys? So I guess one of, one of our benefits is we have a real broad portfolio of destinations and I guess like, like has been previously mentioned, we've seen uh, demand in general increasing and then some bad news story or quarantine changes and it, it, it drops off a cliff and then it picks up again and it's, it's, it's very shaped like that. But it does show there is, the demand does keep coming back. The one thing that has strengthened and strengthened within that is our British Isles tours. And we're getting, I mean... I guess from a year on year perspective, you wouldn't be overly excited, but on, on a week to week basis, we are seeing volume seriously increasing on late to the British Isles. Um, and we're looking at what we're going to do with that program going forward, because it seems there's a lot more confidence when there's uncertainty in international travel in the British mm -hmm. Isles program. Look, the other might extend that or. Yes, yeah, so, so, you know, certainly not, looking not, at not, it. Yeah. And then the other thing within that mix, which is, surprised us but in retrospect probably makes sense the number of single travelers which would normally be 10 15 percent is 30 40 percent right now and and i guess it's logical when you think people have been locked in on their own for a long time this is an opportunity to go away with someone who you have confidence in with like-minded individuals uh, and we think there's going to be a real opportunity in that segment mm -hmm. similarly where you possibly have a couple and one is more nervous than the other they will go on a British Isles tour. They may not go on a long haul trip or something. So there's, there's some pretty interesting avenues that we're looking to explore. We're hopeful that international travel will come back. Um, and once this, this process of reacting quite with such a short timeline, we get a better process of responding as a government and as FCO. We think that will improve as soon as we get consistency on that approach. But the British Isles is definitely something we're looking at a lot more keenly for the short term, especially. Yeah, and, and actually just going back to the point you made a little while ago, Neil, about how you feel as a sector that you have quite a responsibility, you know, to get this right for the whole travel industry. I mean, and, and, and Zena touched on it a bit as well, you know, it's, you know, what is touring, you know, a really good way to, to start because of the fact that you've got your hand held and you've got all these experts and you're not doing it on your own and, you know, do you, do you feel that, you know, I know everyone's suffering, but do you think it sort of plays to your strengths? I think, I think 100%. I think that the fact that people want to get out, but they're a little bit nervous about doing it themselves, particularly single travels, but travellers, but also couples, the fact that the time is filled, you're, you're, you're visiting and seeing new things regularly, um, going back to points made earlier, I think customers are enjoying it probably more because they didn't expect it to be as uh, as good as it, as it is right now. So there's an expectation that we're over delivering on. And part of that is the touring element. You're, you're not sat in one place every day, which is great, but, but this is filling your days up with stuff, with other people you can talk to about it. And, and we're certainly seeing a great response on that front. And the concern that the more mature traveler might be really nervous to travel um is that playing through to, to, you know in terms of demand i mean you see are you because obviously certainly uh riviera and new market you might you, i mean i don't want to make assumptions but i'm thinking you probably have some slightly older travelers in your in yeah. your database you know are you finding that they are just desperate to get out or yeah. are they or, you know, or is it some and some are some still very nervous to travel I mean, I, my point of view, it's, it's, it's not one picture. I mean, there, there definitely are some who are a little bit more nervous and would like to wait until you're know, well into next year. And uh, as you'd expect, I think, you know, but it's not necessarily just the older ones. I mean, it varies. Yeah. But there also are you know, some that are just really keen to get out there. I mean, sort of, because of older people. Yeah, yeah no, exactly. But even the older groups, you see... At risk, we've been told. So yeah, yeah that's right, exactly. And, and there is perhaps an element of that, but I've been very encouraged. I mean, I think the counter to that perhaps is that some of the older group, yeah, they 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 want to get out there. They enjoy traveling. They've been traveling with us for years or whatever it may be. 
they've had a miserable year, they've had to miss a couple of holidays. Yeah, there comes a point where they just can say, you know what, I'm going to get out there. And if you can offer the right level of reassurance, be that sort of booking flexibility or some of the benefits that you talked about, Neil, of, of the sort of escorted tour, but yeah, that, that, that can give them that confidence. Just then a big can, layer of reassurance. Yeah, definitely. Like, I mean, I think, I think they're really, I think it's a bit of a stereotype, which is almost like the older ones don't want to get, actually, some really do. And, and some do more because, you know, they don't know how many more chances they're going to get. They want to get out there. They want to enjoy themselves. Absolutely. And they've got things to do and people, you know, places to go. So I've been actually really encouraged by the, the resilience. Um, right. Which is great. So, yeah. yeah. We've, we've, had, we've had customers who've changed. They're on their fourth iteration because the, the guidelines have changed. But they yeah. keep coming back. Okay, where can I go now? Yeah. They're just desperate to get away. They're not, they're not perturbed. They're not, going to, they're not going to be forced in this. That's brilliant to hear. Final uh, thought from you all, um, really around the role of travel agents. I mean, again, it's been mentioned a little bit, and I know Phil, you said you're out talking to them. Are you? Where are you with it? You know, are you doing Zoom calls with agents? Are you actually back out on the road going to see them? Are you doing webinars? How are you keeping in touch with the trade, and how important are they going to be for you going forward? Well, I mean, I would say just a quick view for me on that is. We're doing all of the above. We've actually grown the size of our sort of quote unquote on the road travel agent team in the UK during this pandemic. And it's been more important than ever to, to work very closely with them. I mean, in many cases, these are our travel agent customers and, and, and we take the responsibility to give them, deliver a fantastic holiday and look after them. And that's something we take, we take very seriously. I think the role is, is, potentially more important than it's been in recent years and again because of that relationship the reassurance the conversation and therefore our ability as a business to work well with those partners is is a very high priority for us going into 2021. Right and Zena, I mean obviously <laughs> you launched your whole you know uh, travel agents day and all the rest of it I mean I guess that was well received but you know what, how, how are you you know working Never. Never thought that the role of a travel agent is uh, as is important as it is right now. We, we almost call it a safety toolkit. You know, you book with your travel agent, with a tour operator, on a group tour, and you'll be safe. You'll be under good hand. You'll have a, a great experience. And if something goes wrong, you still be under good hand. And this is where, uh, to me, it goes all together. So the importance of travel agent has never been as important, I mean, as, as big as, uh, as it is right now. And I can't say uh, this more than... You know, National Travel Agent Day, the initiative came really as we were thinking of how can we recognize that role. So it's um, critic, really important. Okay, well, I'm sure they'll be really pleased to hear that. And Neil, we'll, we should let you say um, how you guys are working with agents as well. Well, it ties back to everything we've said about confidence and the confidence of the customers is so often with that travel agent, um, we wouldn't exist without that relationship. So everything that's been said previously we've just launched love to shop incentives we see this as a channel to get us back out there um, and build on that confidence piece okay all right well listen uh, i know agents can get much more information about um all the things that you're doing for them from the atas um, association and the atas website so uh, and of course from travel weekly always um but we're really grateful for your time today guys we're so excited that you have started i know it's baby steps but we hope to see things um, get back to a bit more normality, as, as, as Phil said. But um, good luck with everything. And so thank you very much to Zena from Intrepid, to Phil from Riviera, and to Neil from Newmarket. Thank you very much thank indeed. You. Thank you, Lucy. Bye.